So for the example today, I'm going to demonstrate how you start a brand new RStudio project and how you put data in it and how you start a new R Markdown file and how you start analyzing data within that R Markdown file to generate um, your analysis and your figures. So let's get started. Um, if you go to the class website for today, um, which you're probably already there since you're watching this video there, um, if you click on examples, let's go to the example for today, which is session one. <clears throat> so there is a data set here, this gapminder.csv file. Go ahead and download that to your computer. We're going to move it around once it's downloaded. Um, in most browsers, if you click on it, it should just try to download. If it tries to open it up in a new tab with a whole bunch of text in it, um, go back, close that tab, and then um, right click on this link and say save link as and then you can save the actual file. Most browsers nowadays recognize CSV files as something you download. Um, so go ahead and click on that and save it. It might want to open it in Excel. Um, you're going to want to avoid that. We don't want to, to mess with Excel. We're just going to bring it right into R. Um, so save it as a file somewhere. It stuck it in my downloads folder. And so we will get started. Um, so if you're using RStudio Cloud, you're going to want to create a new project. If you go to your RStudio Cloud web page and then click on New Project, it will open up a new tab and you'll see something like this, um, a brand new open empty project. And as uh, we talked about during the lesson, um, your standard panes are here, your console, your files, your environment panel is empty, nothing is created. Um, you can go ahead and name your project. Um, something just so it's not untitled. So we'll just say example one. If you're using RStudio on your computer, the process for creating a project is slightly different. Um, that's because when you click on the new project button in RStudio Cloud, it will automatically create a folder on their server somewhere um, named project and then it sticks everything in the project folder. If you're in RStudio on your own computer, um, which you all should eventually do, um, just because it's good best practice, but you can by all means keep using the, the cloud version too. Um, if you go to File, New Project <clears throat> in RStudio, what this lets you do is create a new project. Um, if you choose New Directory, R will create a new folder for you. So if I click here, I want to create a new project. And I'm just going to stick it on my, in my desktop. And so if I name it something like example one, it's going to create a new folder on my desktop called example one. And then that's where R is going to point to. So if you remember from the lesson, R has to look somewhere on your computer for the different files that it works with. If you save a file from R, it's going to put it in that special folder that it's pointing to. Um, the official term for pointing at something in R is a working directory. Um, but RStudio projects automatically set that working directory for you, which is super nice because you don't have to worry about all the paths and stuff. So it will automatically create a project a folder in my desktop folder called example one, and it will switch to that project. If I already have a folder on my computer that I want to use as the project folder, then instead of choosing new directory, I can choose existing directory, and it won't create a new folder. It will just stick an R project file in that folder. Um, in general, I typically make a project before I start saving any files anywhere. So I, use, I usually use this new directory approach, but you can do whatever you want. So we're going to create a new project, example one. It's going to go on the desktop. You can uncheck this Git repository thing. We're not going to cover anything Git related um, in this class. If you do anything with like code version control through GitHub, then you would probably want to use a Git in repository, but we're not covering that. And this rnv um, thing here, you don't need to worry about that. That's something far more technical. If you want to have separate environments of R, it's kind of like mini versions of R in different folders. If you're familiar with Python, it's similar to Python environments. You don't need to worry about that. So you can just leave those things unchecked. Um, if you're already working in a project, Sometimes it's helpful to have a second project. And so if you click on this button here, it will create a second session of RStudio instead of closing the one that's open right now. Um, but because right now this is just regular RStudio, not pointed anywhere, it's pointed at my home directory, we'll just not tell it to open a new session. So if I click on Create Project, it will make a new directory. 
on my desktop. We can verify it if we come over to Finder and we look at desktop. There should be a new folder here called example one. And the only thing in it right now is this example1.rproj file, which as we talked about in the lesson and as you read in some of the lesson materials, that's just a special text file that says this is a project folder. Um, it's just a regular folder, it's not anything special. It's just a place the R is now pointed at. Um, we can verify that if you come look at R itself. Um, you'll see over in the console, it has the path to your working directory. So desktop example one, R is pointed there. If you look at the files panel, you can see that there's just one thing in there and that's that R project file, hooray. You can also look up at this top corner in the top right corner, if you click on this little drop down menu, it shows you all of your most recent projects. And so you can see I've got a whole bunch of random projects here. Um, <clears throat> if you click on the actual project name, like if I click on slides, it will close my current project and then switch to the slides project. If I click on this icon next to the name of the project, it will actually open up a second RStudio. So if I click on this, if you look down in my doc, now I have two RStudios going. One is pointed at the course website. That's this DataVizM thing that is opening up right now, DataVizM20. Um, it's loading. <laughs> but we also have example one. And there's actually, if you make this doc big enough, you can see the labels, the example one, and then DataVizM once that shows up. So sometimes you can have like five or six different RStudio projects open all at once. That's totally normal. Um, in RStudio Cloud, that would be uh, analogous to having a whole bunch of different tabs open to different projects. It's the same idea. It's just instances of RStudio pointed somewhere at your computer. Okay, so we have this set up now. We have a project. Um, we want to put stuff in it. We have that Gapminder CSV file that we just downloaded. We want to have it be accessible to R to R within our project here. So what we're going to do is outside of our studio, we're going to go to Finder and we're going to go to my downloads folder and I'm just going to drag this Gapminder data set into that folder. Um, so now in my example folder, I have the R project file and I have a CSV file just floating around there. If I come back to our studio, I'll see the same thing. Here's my example folder. Um, there's the project and then there's the CSV file. Um, general best practices when you're doing stuff with R is to not keep everything in this one directory here. Um, especially if you're working with multiple data sets, it's helpful to have like one unified location for all of your data, one unified location for any of the figures that you make, any tables that you output, um, and to have it kind of better separated and organized. And so that's something I like to do as well. So what we can do is move this Gapminder um, CSV file into a new folder within our project folder. Um, you can use RStudio to create a new folder. If you click on this new folder button, it will create a new folder. You can also just do um, whatever your operating system uses for creating folders. So if you're in Windows, you can come right click and say new folder. If you're on a Mac, you can right click and say new folder. Um, we're just going to call this data. It doesn't have to be called data. It can be called whatever you want. Um, it's just like, there's nothing magical about having it be called data. That's just a place where we're gonna put stuff. And then I'm going to take this Gapminder CSV file and put it in the data folder. So now if I come back to our studio and look at my files panel, you'll notice it has that same project file that's showing that this is an RStudio project. Um, and now we have a data folder. And if I click on that, it should show the Gapminder CSV file. If you're using RStudio Cloud, the process is slightly different because you can't just make new folders um, on their server. So what you have to do is you create the new folder, we'll just call it data. And if we go into the data folder, we can then choose to upload a file. And so here, oh, it's gone. Let's go find it. So here's that CSV file. We can upload the CSV file to the data folder and now it's there. So this doesn't give us direct access to like the whole file system. So we have to use these buttons here to upload and download stuff. If we want to get it later, or if we export a figure and we want to download it, you can click on the checkbox here. And then into this more menu, you can say export, and that will download the CSV file to your computer. Um, so that's how you get stuff in and out of RStudio Cloud. 
So let's go back to our RStudio instance on my computer here. So we have our data, we have our project, we need to start doing stuff with it now. So we're gonna create a new R Markdown file and we're gonna analyze the data and make a new figure with the R Markdown file. So I'm going to click on new file, R Markdown. It provides this dialogue here where you can type a title in, you can type an author name, you can choose your main output format. I typically don't do anything with this because I'll just overwrite it when I make the actual files. I just, once I see this dialogue, I hit okay. And then I click right here. So in this whole top section here in between these three dashes, this is all the metadata for your document. It shows what the title is, the date, author, kind of other important settings and information about your document. Um, anything after these last three lines is either text that you've typed or code um, that you're using to um, analyze stuff. And so we're gonna type our own text and our own code so we don't really need the stuff that's here. This is all just placeholder stuff. So what I typically do is I just select here, scroll all the way to the bottom and delete. And so that's kind of my shortcut way of getting an empty R Markdown file that's ready for me to put stuff in. So I'm gonna change the title to example one, and I'm gonna put my name here. Um, we can have the date there. Sure, we're recording this on a Saturday. We'll just delete that. Okay. And the reason why like none of this is super important, we can change this if we, right now, if I click on this knit button, it will create an HTML document. But if I click on this drop down menu and choose one of these other options, it will actually change this HTML document to docx document or PDF document. And so that's like, that stuff gets changed all the time. So let's go ahead and save our R Markdown file that's empty. So we're gonna click on that save button um, or press control S or command S on a Mac. And we're just gonna call this my example thing. Um, it will automatically add the RMD extension for you. Um, best practice for working with these RMD files is to not use spaces. Um, if you do use a space, it's fine. It will just like add dashes when you knit stuff and convert to HTML. So I like to just save the hassle of having it add the dashes and I add my own dashes or underscores. So we're gonna save it as my example thing.rmd. So again, look in your files panel. You should have a data folder. We should have an R Markdown file and we should have our project file. Um, so now we're going to type stuff. In real life, you might have like an introduction where you explain what the data is. We'll be even fancier here. So you'd say, here's an explanation of our data. You might have a section called like methodology or a description of your data. Um, all sorts of things that you can include in here. <clears throat> and then we can get to the point where we're going to load and graph data. Okay, so none of this is our code again. This is just text that we have typed. This is a first level heading. We can make this be a second level heading by adding a second pound sign. Um, we can add lists. So if I hit enter here, and enter here and enter here. If I put dashes in front of each of these lines, wow, it's going to make those turn into lists when I convert this to HTML. <clears throat> okay, so down here we want to load our data and graph our data. So we're gonna shrink this down a little bit so we can see better. So we're gonna insert a new chunk for code. So if we come up to this insert menu, and then we're gonna insert an R chunk, you can use other languages. You can actually mix R and Python all together in one document, which is really cool if you use Python. Um, so you can just click on insert R chunk. You can also do it with your keyboard. If you press command option I on a Mac or control alt I on, a, on Windows. So what we're gonna do is load our data and start looking at it. Um, for this class, pretty much the very first thing you'll ever do in an R session is load the tidyverse library. Because 
this will load a whole bunch of um, different packages that all work together. So when you load library tidyverse, it will load ggplot2, it will load dplyr for using mutate and filter and summarize and group by, it will load tidyr for using gather and spread and pivot functions, it will load readr, or readr, um, that lets you read CSV files. <clears throat> and so typically it's just best if you say library tidyverse. And I just pressed Command Enter or Control Enter, so it will run that chunk um, because my line was there. I could my cursor was on that line. I could have also pressed this play button, and it would run that chunk. Or if I press Command Shift Enter or Control Shift Enter on Windows, it will run the whole chunk that you're in. So if you notice, it spat out a whole bunch of information here. None of this is bad. It's just saying that it's loaded these eight packages. So there's ggplot, there's tidyr, there's dplyr. Um, it does have some conflicts. You typically don't need to worry about these. This just means like if you write a package, you can name a function whatever you want. Um, one of the core functions in R is mean, which calculates the average. If you want to write your own package and write a function named mean, um, you can. Um, it will just override the mean that is built into R and cause a conflict. So if you think you're trying to figure out the average and you load your package that has your fancy version of mean, it's going to use that one instead. So that's, what's, that, that's what is happening here. There's some built-in function in the R package named stats, which is just built into R, called lag. And dplyr just loaded its own lag and there's a filter function that does something, dplyr just loaded its own filter. So it's just warning you here that that happens. You typically don't need to worry about it. If you don't care about all of this output, which if you're trying to make a nice clean document that mixes code and, and text, you don't wanna see all of these messages when you create, when you knit to HTML and create the document. So one thing you can do is if you click on this little gear icon um, in the chunk options, you can actually tell this chunk to not show the warnings and to not show the messages. So that way it won't spit out any of these warnings and saying that there's conflicts or anything like that. It'll just have nice clean output. You don't wanna do that all the time. Um, you can like universally turn off every single warning and message, but then if they're like legitimate warnings and legitimate messages, you won't see them and that's not helpful. Um, but if you have a chunk that you know is going to give a warning and you don't care about the warning, then turn off the warnings. So we can click on apply. Um, so now if I run this chunk again, watch what happens. There's no extra output. Um, it doesn't have any of the warnings and messages. It's just nice and clean. There's no way, no easy way of telling that we've loaded the tidyverse library. Um, the only way to really tell is if you come to the packages panel and scroll down to something that should have been loaded, like dplyr, um, it should have a checkbox by it. Mm, I skipped it. There, no, there it is, dplyr. Has a checkbox by it, it was loaded, so we're good to go. Um, if you close R and reopen it again, none of the packages that you've loaded will be there, will be loaded again. You have to run library tidyverse again to reload all of those packages. Um, and so it, it's good practice to like, when you open up in one of your old scripts, when you load R, um, make sure you run all of the code to make sure it's generating everything and loading all of the libraries. Okay, so we have library tidyverse and now we're going to load our data using the read CSV function, and we're gonna save it as an object named gapminder, because that's the name of the data set. So we're gonna type gapminder, and we're gonna do the assignment key, that backwards arrow. Um, you can either type those two characters, the, the less than sign and the minus, or if you press uh, alt minus or option minus on a Mac, it will do it for you. And so we're gonna say read underscore CSV. And what we have to do, if you look, there's this little tooltip thing that popped up that shows all of the different arguments that we can give to read CSV. You can also look at the help file here for read CSV. It needs a file name, a path to a file name. So that's going to be in quotes. We're going to say data slash gapminder. And our studio is smart enough that 
it knows that this is going to be a folder. And so I all I had to do is start typing GA and I put, hit tab and it finished the name of the file for me. So there's a gap minder. Again, it doesn't have to be data. If you named your data folder something else, that's fine. It just has to be whatever you named it here. So now if I run this chunk, it's going to load tidyverse, but it's also going to read the CSV file. And so if you look at your environment panel here, there's a new data set called Gapminder. And if I click on Gapminder, it will open it up in a new tab. And so you can see all of the columns and all of the rows. So we have a whole bunch of different countries, um, years, continents, life expectancies. You can actually click on these column headings to sort by them. So you can sort by life expectancy get all the Afghanistans here, get all of the 1952s here. So you can manipulate the data. You can also filter it if you want, just as you're browsing, so you can see where um, like Venezuela is. There it is. And so now it's only showing Venezuela. Neat. Um, you can also filter with numeric things. Um, so like life expectancy, if we click here, we can say only look at countries that are between 30 and 50 for life expectancy, now it's just showing that. So you can do lots of cool things here in, in this uh, data viewer. You can also click on this blue arrow next to Gapminder, and it will show you all of the, the column titles, basically. So you can see all of the columns here in the first few rows of each of the columns. So that's also a convenient way of kind of looking at what you have in your, in your current data set. So what we're going to do now We've loaded that Gapminder data. We're going to plot it, but we only want to plot one specific year. We don't want to plot um, back to 1952. We just want to plot, let's choose 1992, because I saw it there first. So we're going to filter this Gapminder data set to only show us 1992 data. So if you remember from the uh, lesson that you worked through, we can use the dplyr function filter to select only the rows where year is equal to 1992. So what we'll do is we're going to type uh, some code here that says gap. We're going to make a new data set called gapminder underscore 1992. We can name that whatever we want. There's nothing special about that. Um, we're going to set this equal to gapminder. Um, and we're going to use the pipe function to feed gapminder into filter so that we can then only choose rows where year is equal to 1992. That pipe function, um, you covered it in the, in the lessons that you worked through with RStudio primers. Um, you can type it, there's a shortcut for it in RStudio. If you do Command Shift M or Control Shift M, it'll do those three characters for you. Um, you can also just do the percent greater than percent manually if you want to. So we're gonna say filter and we want year to be equal to 1992. The reason I did a double equal sign here is because I'm making a comparison. This is the same, uh, this would be similar to saying it's less than 1992 or greater than 1992. This is saying is equal to 1992. If I just did one, that would be trying to tell it to set the year argument inside filter to 1992. Kind of like here, this is technically file equals data slash gapminder. But there is no year argument to filter, and so it's going to complain and not know what to do. Um, but because we're making a comparison, we use the double equals. And so the way I remember that is when I'm reading this, I will say year is equal to 1992. And like is equal to means use two equal signs. Um, it's just the thing you have to remember when you're making comparisons. If you're looking to see if it's exactly equal to, you have to use two equal signs. So now if I run this whole chunk, I can either press Control shift enter or Command shift enter or I can click on this play button. It'll run this entire chunk. So it's again loading the tidyverse. It's loading this CSV file. And now it's making a second data set called Gapminder 1992 that is only 1992. And if we look over in the environment panel, that is indeed the case. We have our Gapminder data set with 1700 rows. And we have the 1992 version of it that's only 142 rows. And if we click on it, we'll see, go. We'll see that the year column is only 1992. If we sort by it to get lower years first, again, it's just all 1992 all the way through. So that's good.
Okay, so if this was real life and we were explaining how we cleaned the data, we might even say like we loaded the original data and filtered it so it only showed 1992 or something like that. So that we're annotating what we're doing just in the regular text and then we do it. So now we're going to make a graph using this stuff. So we're going to insert a new chunk. Uh, we'll just say, now we make a graph. Okay, so we're going to insert a new chunk, either with the menu or with Command Option I or Control Alt I. And in this graph, or in this chunk, we're going to use ggplot to make a graph. So we're going to say ggplot. Um, the data set that we're going to use is Gapminder. 1992. The mappings, this is where we take, wow, mapping. This is where we say, what do we want to be on the x axis? What do we want to be on the y axis? So we're going to say AES for aesthetics. And we'll cover this more in a couple days, but you got some exposure to this um, when you were doing the RStudio primers. So we say x equals, this has to be a name of the column. So we're going to look at our data set and say, Life expect, no, they did GDP per capita on the x axis. So we have to spell it exactly like this GDP with a capital P per cap. So let's come back here. We're going to say GDP per cap. And then our Y is going to be life expectancy, which I think is spelled this way. Again, it has to match what the column name is. So life capital E expect EXP. Yep, that matches. And then we're going to color these points by continent. And I think the pop or the column name is just continent. Yep. Continent. Okay. Then we're going to add a geom layer to actually show this data. If we ran this right now, let's go ahead and do it. If I click on this play sign here, it will create a graph with nothing in it. Yep. It does have life expectancy on the y-axis, and it has GDP per capita on the x-axis, so that's good. But there's no actual points there. That's because we have to tell ggplot to use a specific geometry, um, which is geom point. Okay, so if we just add geom point here and run it, now we should get points that are all colored by continent. And we have life expectancy here. We have GDP per capita, and so you can see that life expectancy is increasing as GDP per capita increases as well. And that's how we make a plot. So we can go ahead and save that. If I click on this knit button, what it will do is go through and run all of these chunks of code, and then it will convert all of the output and all of the text to an HTML file. So let's go ahead and click on that. If you look down in the console while it's running, it'll show you which chunk it's working on. It'll give you like a progress bar down here showing sequentially that it's going through each of the chunks. Um, so it is going, it's ordinarily a lot faster. It's just that I have this recording program on here and that's taking up most of my computer's resources. And so it's kind of going slow, but it should be almost done. There it goes. So you should now have a fancy HTML file with our headings, with the paragraphs that we typed. Here is the, the lists that we added. So that worked. And now we get to the load and graph data section. So we say we loaded the original data. Here's the code to do that. Now we make a graph. Here's the code to do that. And there's our picture. And it worked. Um, and so now we can um, distribute that HTML file. If we look in Finder or in Windows Explorer, you'll see that we have a new HTML file sitting right there. So you could attach that to an email, you can upload it to a server somewhere and share that. Um, you could also knit to Word and it'll create a Word document. You can knit to PDF and it'll create a PDF document. And it will put all of those things in your main working directory, in your project directory. Um, which is why it's important to use these projects. If you don't, it's going to put it in some random folder on your computer and it's going to be hard to find. Um, but here, because we're using this project, it's going to stick it in that working directory because R is pointed at that place. Um, a couple other minor things that we can do here. If you notice down here at the bottom of the editor, there's this um, orange 
hashtag pound sign button. This is actually a table of contents for your document. If you're using markdown headings, like heading one and heading two and heading three, and uh, what it will do is it'll show you a list of all of those and all of those headings and basically make a table of contents for you. And you can skip around. So if I want to jump back to the introduction, I can click here and I'm at the introduction. If I come here, I can come back down to load and graph data and it'll let you jump around, which is really convenient if you're working with longer documents. Um, you can just jump around to different sections. It also shows the chunks that you're working with. Right now, it just says this is chunk one and chunk two. That's not very descriptive. Um, in this case, we know that we only have those two chunks of code, and so we can remember that chunk one is loading the data, chunk two is plotting the data. But if you have a longer document with like 10, 15, 20 chunks, that's going to be really hard to keep track of. And so good practice for working with these R Markdown files is to actually name these chunks. Um, the way you do that is you can either use this gear icon and it has a section for chunk name. So we can say like load libraries and data. Um, the rules for the chunk names is you're not allowed to have any spaces and it can't start with a number, but you can have numbers later. You just can't start with a number. So if I click on apply, you'll notice that in this chunk settings area where we said message equals false and warning equals false, we now have the chunk name, load libraries data, and then we have a comma, and then the other options. So now if we look at our table of contents, it actually has the name there for us. And so that's helpful. So we can come down to this other chunk and rather than clicking on this gear icon, we can just type it manually right here and we can say make first plot. And now it's called make first plot. So if we look at our table of contents, we've got both of those chunks there, they're named, we know what they're doing, and that's great. Um, one final thing we can do with this, we can actually resize this plot in the document when, when it's created. Um, again, we can use this gear icon to modify the chunk options. And if you click on use custom figure size, we can actually tell it to, um, to make the figure maybe like six inches wide and three inches tall. So it'll be more rectangular and shorter. Um, it's actually make, yeah, three inches tall, that's good. And if you click apply, you can see that it generated the code for you and put it right in the chunk options. Um, once you get the hang of this, you can actually just type that yourself. Um, I rarely use this gear icon now, unless I forget like the actual syntax for this, this fig.width and fig.height. Um, but now that we have that set, um, let's go ahead and knit and we'll look at what's happening when you're knitting. And so again, we saw the progress bar, but it was kind of small, so we couldn't really watch what was happening. So what it's doing is it's running the load libraries data chunk because we added the label, we know what it's doing. Um, so it's thinking about it. If you hide any of the warnings and messages, they'll actually show up here. Um, just so you can still see them. They're just not going to end up in the output. And then it ran make first plot and it should be six inches wide and three inches tall if we scroll down yeah so now it's a shorter plot and a wider plot because we told it on um, the dimensions and so that is how you create stuff with our markdown that's how you uh, mess with different chunk options and change different settings and now everything is all self-contained here in one folder um, so that's kind of a super quick introduction to our studio and our projects and you'll get practice with this with your exercise. So go ahead and go over there and try it out.